This is Capital Notes from Milwaukee's NPR. I'm Mayan Silver. Wisconsin Democrats are gearing up for their state political convention this weekend. J.R. Ross is here to give us a preview. He's editor of WISPolitics.com. Welcome, J.R. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. So the Republican National Convention is getting a lot of attention locally. It'll be held in Milwaukee, but the Democratic National Convention will not be far off. It's in Chicago this year. Wisconsin Democrats are having their state political convention this weekend. What are you looking out for? Uh, A couple of things. One, you're going to see Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker come and speak. National Chair Jimmy Harrison come and speak. Look, these state conventions are essentially a big pep rally for the base, the party faithful, the ones who stuff envelopes, uh, staff the phone banks, encourage their friends to turn out and vote. Like these are the ones who are the lifeblood of the party. So just like for Republicans in Appleton back in May, for Democrats in Milwaukee in June, it's all about kind of giving a little bit of a burst of enthusiasm for the long slog ahead because we've got several months of the election. There's a lot of work ahead. Uh, they're going to try and drive messages about what they want to do, get the base excited, and kind of look for the, the positive message toward this fall as you're ready for, you know, the negative ads to fly and all the craziness to happen. Well, and with the Republican State Convention, you were talking about several things that you were looking for, um, what was going to happen with the delegates or the committee yep. man and committee woman. Are you looking for those kinds of same things here? There are races for members of the Democratic National Committee this year. That'll be interesting to watch to see. Um, there are a couple incumbents. One of them is Alex Lazary. Uh, was a Bucks executive. Now he's with the Biden administration. Another uh, Andrew Worthman up in Eau Claire. They're both incumbents. So, you know, do they get any, any challenge? I think they're open seats for the spots, other two spots in the National Committee. So, but yeah, it's, it's something worth watching. These are not, let's say, high-profile races. I've not heard the same kind of um, chatter about these being possibly symbolic of, you know, the new guard versus the old guard, like with Republicans. At the same time, you know, everything we've seen with Democrats, involving Democrats lately, any kind of big event, there has been a protest about Palestine. Will we see any disruptions at the convention? Will we see a big presence? Will there be any protests at this convention at the casino, you know, Potawatomi Casino and Hotel, that again underscores that there's a split in the Democratic base about the Biden administration's approach to Israel and, and Palestine? Well, recently Biden announced that he's behind a plan that he's trying to get Israel and Hamas on board with. Do you think that's having any political momentum with when it comes to protesting and things like that? We'll see. I mean, uh, Jill Biden was in Milwaukee last week for Festa Italiana, and her speech was interrupted several times by protesters. So, you know, there's still some energy there about that issue. Uh, I'm not sure how it will be expressed at state convention. These are usually not places where you see a lot of big protests, so it's definitely something I'm watching to see if there's, you know, a big split in the base over that issue. You know, just Timmy Baldwin, for example, getting angry. She's called for a ceasefire, but there are people unhappy that she, how long it took her to, to join that call. Will she get any interruptions? Will the governor, you know, just kind of watch and see how the, the party base responds to the folks who are in power right now. And you've said that one of the most interesting parts of conventions for you is actually the debate around resolutions. You said that party activists get very intense about these issues and it shows kind of the political spectrum extremes have similar suspicions, for (laughs) instance, you know, about the federal government and that kind of thing. What did you learn at the, at the GOP convention on that front? And what are you looking for at the democratic convention? You know, uh, at the Republican convention, there are a lot of the usual things about abortion. What's interesting uh, there, you have people on the stage, Republican convention who are telling delegates, Hey, I know you may feel the certain way about this issue of abortion, but we have to win elections. And if we're one on one elections, we have to maybe accept a moderate position publicly or with our leaders to win. And acknowledging this is not maybe sitting well with some of the the delegates. And sure enough, you read the party platform and it talks about, uh, you know, abortion in very uncompromising terms. So you got that. The Democrats that have not seen the resolutions yet usually don't get those publicly until we're at the convention. But will there be a Palestine resolution? You know, if there is, how will that be debated? How will that go? I mean, just watching these things that are are fracture points for the two parties, how do they play out with the party base? Now, with the Republicans, there wasn't a debate over the resolutions uh, because 
they put them all into a big document. They're going to debate them, but the uh, convention went so long that Saturday they said, okay, we're going to pass them all in Moss and go home. So there wasn't a debate with the Democrats. They've put out time side on Sunday to have that conversation. So we'll see how deep in the weeds they get in on those issues and, and what are the ones that, you know, are there anything splitting the party or causing a lot of angst? And when it comes to the presidential race, you know, beyond a convention, there's the parties and the campaign's infrastructure. You talked in a previous Capitol Notes about how the Biden campaign has been opening offices, getting staffers on the ground, 44 offices and 80 staffers, and that Republicans really aren't there yet. Is that still the case? And what are you seeing there? For what we see, yes. Um, you know, I just talked to Ben Wickler, the state chair, this week to preview convention. He was touting again the infrastructure, the number of offices. Now, you've also seen nationally uh, the Trump campaign talk about the hall, fundraising hall they pulled in after his conviction on 34 counts in New York. They are talking about how that's spurring a lot of uh, activity from donors. Might they then turn that into money for build infrastructure? We shall see. But as far as we can tell right now, Democrats have an advantage there. Now, go back to 2016, Trump didn't have a lot of infrastructure in Wisconsin. He didn't really have much of a campaign built around that. He still won. So it's not the end-all, be-all. Infrastructure, people do indoors. They can help on the margins, but you can't beat back a tide. So if the environment favors one party or another, you're likely not going to reverse that because of your infrastructure. But if it's a close race, if it's 50-50, then that's when it counts. And right now, Democrats have an advantage there. We'll see... If Republicans can make up for that with, you know, volunteers and other efforts to kind of close that gap between now and Election Day. You're tuned into Capital Notes. I'm WEWM's Mayan Silver speaking with J.R. Ross, editor of WizPolitics.com. OK, we'll turn to some other big news from the week, which is that Democratic Attorney General Josh Call brought felony charges, forgery charges against two attorneys and an aide who worked for Trump in 2020. They're accused of submitting paperwork that falsely claimed Trump won Wisconsin that year, connected to the slate of false electors. What do we need to know here? Well, a couple of things. One, um, this is the first step. These three all have an initial appearance scheduled in September uh, on these charges. It's a Class H felony, if I remember correctly. And really, it's interesting that call, there are other states where there were these schemes to put false electors in place for Trump and Biden won. Prosecutors in places like Georgia, Michigan, Arizona had moved much earlier than Call did on this issue. So one, Call has taken some flack from Democrats about kind of the speed at which he's gone with this case. Um, Two, are we going to see an actual conviction here? Like what's going to happen next? I'm really watching that. You know, there's a question from Republicans. They feel like, when I talk to them, this was all basically an effort to preserve Donald Trump's legal options when it came to challenging the results of the 2020 election, that basically, you know, Trump was in court. Uh, I think the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago on Christmas Eve rejected one case there. He had a request pending before the state U.S. Supreme Court to hear his challenge that was rejected by the state Supreme Court in Wisconsin. So there are still avenues that were uh, kind of active a little bit, though a long shot. So they argue this was just part of that. But if you read the indictment, the picture Call is trying to paint is that these two attorneys, especially Jim Troopas uh, from Wisconsin and Ken Chesbrough, were basically engineering this entire scheme to overturn the results. That there's even a passage in the documents where the seem to be they kind of acknowledge that Biden had won Wisconsin. They're still trying to somehow flip the state in uh, Trump's favor. And then Michael Roman is an aide to the was an aide to Trump campaign deeply involved in all that stuff as well. They're trying to paint these guys as really the driving force behind it. Worth noting, the 10 Republicans who signed the false uh, elector documents were not part of those charged. They reached a civil settlement with a law firm that had sued them over their participation in that effort. Call would not answer any questions about whether they could be charged or even Trump himself, saying that the investigation was ongoing and they will follow wherever it leads. Uh, but there's you know kind of an interesting dynamic for call where Republicans think he's gone overboard, but Democrats think he's basically not gone fast enough or been aggressive enough in this case. I don't know if my conversations, this issue alone really drives voters. Um, I mean, in- inflation, the economy, you know, abortion are much more 
uh, driving issues, it seems like, for voters. But this is definitely an issue that gets some attention and is very important for some people. And it's interesting to see, will it really play a big factor come this fall? And places like Georgia, which you mentioned, and other states have have brought kind of like racketeering charges, Mm -hmm. conspiracy charges. Um, Why did Cole not go for something more like broad in, in Wisconsin? Good question. All he would tell us is that he followed the evidence, that the investigation was all about what evidence they had, uh, where it took them, and that that's what they focused on. That's all he would say. He really would dive into, for example, Ron Johnson, the U.S. Senator from Oshkosh, he you know, really criticized this decision by call, argued it was just legal advice. I try to ask the Attorney General at the news conference, hey, at what point did this cross from legal advice to a you know, a conspiracy to commit fraud, he would answer that question. He said, it's all in the indictment. Just know that we did the investigation according to what the, d- the details or information we had, and we can't talk about what else might happen. So that's all we know so far. You mentioned the civil lawsuit that was brought against uh, Chesbro Troopas and the 10 Wisconsin electors that was settled last year. What was the biggest political impact of that? We haven't really seen one, you know. I mean, it's not like the people who are false electors have paid a price so far. Uh, Bob Spindell is a Republican appointee to the Elections Commission. He's still on the commission. He was one of them. Uh, One of the women who was an elector, a false elector. The state GP just elected her national committee woman, um, make make her a member of the national party. So there hasn't been a price to pay politically for those folks who were part of that effort in that regard. Uh, But there is a legal price possibly to pay for those who drove that train and that Josh Call is now targeting. Do you think that given the 2024 election happening in such short order in the next five months and Trump is still on the train of claiming that was that he won Wisconsin in public forums, do you think that there would be an infrastructure to support Trump's, Trump's uh, rejection of the results if it were to come to that? in Wisconsin or these civil lawsuits and these, you know, litigation in place would prevent future situations like that? Well, the 10 electors who participated in the 2020 effort pledged them part of this civil settlement not to be part of the elector again. But that said, um, Donald Trump is not committed to accepting the results of the 2024 election. We've seen other high profile Republicans do the same in their comments saying they wanted to you know, basically make sure everything was run properly before they committed to that. There's nothing that would prevent a similar scheme, like, you know, other than like you could get charged if you were part of it, you know, the penalty of what's going on right now. But if Donald Trump says that, you know, I won, I didn't lose, and that's hypothetical, right? Like we're still a ways away from that. Like let's, we're still in early June, but there's not anything that's been changed electorally in Wisconsin, like legally in Wisconsin, to prevent this from happening again. Except the precedent of these cases having been brought and the fact that it's yep. on people's awareness, like it was a scheme that sure. that had never been tried before. It wasn't on people's radars. And now it's been, you know, it, there's an awareness yeah. about this there, type of thing. Definitely. Definitely. It's been brought up like there is a pushback. But let's let's be honest. I mean, there is a good chunk of the Republican base that sides of Donald Trump believe that he won Wisconsin, falsely believes he won Wisconsin. Like we've had two audits that have upheld uh, the results. Other studies have shown no widespread fraud. But if you have a base that is bought into that belief, false as it may be, uh, I don't know it'd be that hard to find 10 people that would participate in something like this again. All right. Well, thanks again for, for spelling all this out for us, JR. And thanks for joining me on Capital Notes. Hey, anytime. That was JR Ross, editor of WISPolitics.com, speaking with me, WUWM's Mayan Silver. Listen for our segments every other Monday with an extended segment on Lake Effect, and check out the Capital Notes podcast wherever you get your podcasts.